have the pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dan Tullier. He's uh, kind of homegrown here in the Bay Area. He went to Georgetown, then came back to UCSF for medical school and orthopedic residency. Then he went to University of Washington for his foot and ankle fellowship. And uh, he uh, loves all sports. He's the team physician for the Oakland Roots. And uh, he's been a fan favorite of our course for several years. So he's going to talk about foot and ankle and also do the exam for you guys. So thanks for coming, Dr. Tullier. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Luke, for that uh, nice intro. And welcome, everybody, to the penalty shootout portion of the Friday afternoon PCSM. Glad you guys made it through uh, defending like Croats tonight. So today we're gonna to go through uh, the agony of the Dutch or the foot 2022, or um, also the uh, top five problems in um, primary care. All right, I do not have any disclosures to share. Um, so for this talk, we're gonna go over plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, Achilles ruptures, because I don't want anyone to miss one, ankle sprains. Also, I'm gonna talk briefly about Liz Frank dislocations and how difficult they are to uh, diagnose sometimes, AKA Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, and then we're gonna end with talking about everyone's favorite, which is bunions. So plantar fasciitis, I'm sure some of you probably woke up with feeling some of it this morning because it's incredibly common. About 10% of Americans will have some form of heel pain and 90% of this is plantar fasciitis. It results in about 1 million medical visits annually Symptoms usually most commonly is plantar medial heel pain, often worse in the morning, often worse with activity. Um, so it can be really worse when people have a lot of startup pain, getting up from sitting, driving, things where things are, uh, things where the heel and the hind foot are stable and then they move, but then also with prolonged activity it will be painful as well. Um, the thing about the heel is there are multiple things that can cause heel pain. And while the vast majority are plantar fasciitis, it is important to know there are some other things on the differential diagnosis as well. You can see here drawn out kind of the areas of pain on physical exam that are most common presenting areas for these specific things. So plantar fasciitis, usually on the plantar side, it's really on that plantar medial aspect of the origin, right uh, at the calcaneus there. You can also get calcaneus stress fractures, which tend to present more on the side. Central heel pain, which is an inflammation of the central heel fat pad, which is also quite common, usually directly underneath. And then trapping to the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve. And so all these are very close and they can present very similarly. So it's important that your physical exam, as we'll go through, um, can hopefully get you uh, a little further along that path. Um, the pathophysiology of this, it's inflammation of the plantar fascial insertion at the medial plantar aspect of the calcaneus. The plantar fascia runs down the whole length of the foot, but far and away the most common area where it gets inflamed is at the insertion. Uh, you can see here on this x-ray on the right side of your screen, a lot of people will develop this heel spur. A lot of patients will focus on that, thinking that that's the source of their pain. The spur itself is not really the source of the pain, like it can be in other joints or other areas, but it is often a sign that there is ongoing inflammation there. However, I'll tell you as someone who sees a tons of x-rays all the time, absolutely that heel spur can be there without the inflammation and without plantar fasciitis. So that's where the physical exam and history and everything else are important. These people typically will be tender to palpation right at that plantar medial aspect of the calcaneus. They will often have tight Achilles gastrox and hamstrings as Stephanie was just talking about. It all kind of runs together and they may or may not have this bone spur. The treatment for this is almost always non-operative. And it can be a really frustrating problem for a lot of people because it can be really quite painful and quite debilitating, and it can really take many, many months to resolve. The mainstay of treatment and the most effective thing in all of our studies really is stretching. So Achilles, gastroc, plantar fascial stretching. There's plenty of resources online. The AOFAS, Foot Care MD have stretches that you can give your patients if need be, um, but it is really helpful and really is the mainstay. Heel cups, padding in that area can be helpful. Oftentimes if people have a really hard shoe or they have hard orthotics, you can push on that plantar fascia and kind of reiterate that inflammation as the day goes on. Arch supports can be helpful in certain circumstances, especially semi-rigid ones. Sometimes the hard ones are just too hard and even over-the-counter ones can be helpful. 
night splints can be helpful, especially for people that have a lot of morning pain. So if you have a lot of morning pain because you're clenching at night, clenching tight, and then waking up, stretching out that plantar fascia, keeping it stretched while you're sleeping can be really helpful. And people who are really struggling to walk, struggling to get through day to day, a brief period of immobilization in a cam walk or a cast can be helpful as well. And we're talking four weeks, six weeks. We try not to go much longer because it can start to cause other issues, um, but it can be good, especially when people are really struggling and really having a lot of pain. Injections are also a possibility, including steroid injections. They do have an increased rupture rate. Uh, a rupture of the, Achille, of, of the plantar fascia um, can hurt and be painful. Um, at, thankfully though, they almost all will heal. So even if you were to inject it and it was to rupture, usually you put them in a cam walker or a cast, you isolate them for a little while and they will actually heal down. So that part's okay. Some additional treatments that have come up lately, I didn't include here because they're still kind of being worked out in terms of their uh, efficacy. Extracorporeal shock wave. Um, there's some level three and level four studies showing some benefit to that. Um, and then 10X, which is kind of a minimally invasive kind of uh, procedure to try and kind of agitate the area and provide some blood supply. And there also has some, again, level four studies that have shown some ability as well. And so those are other things to potentially consider if you're trying going down the algorithm of your treatments and your patients just are not quite getting better. Um, I take this Steve Quirk quote, I can tell you if you're listening out there, if you have plantar fasciitis, stay away from surgery. I can say that from the bottom of my heart, rehab, 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 don't let anyone get in there. Steve was actually saying this about back surgery, but it applies here too. And the reason for that is because though we do do surgery for plantar fasciitis, we really reserve it for the very end because the results are just very mixed. Even in the best studies we have, either looking at plantar fascia releases or gastroc releases or the combination of the two, they maybe have about a 70% efficacy rate, which for us is unfortunately not nearly as high as we'd like for a lot of these surgeries. And so we really try to get people better without um, having to go that route. And for 90, 95% of people, that's certainly the case. And so um, plantar fasciitis, thing one. The next incredibly common thing that I'm sure a lot of you have seen and maybe some of you are suffering from is Achilles tendonitis. Again, it represents two to 10% of the general population and 24 to 50% of lifetime runners will have some degree of Achilles tendonitis. It is incredibly common. What's the most common symptoms? Pain in the Achilles tendon area. And oftentimes people will have heel pain and you need to distinguish. Obviously pain that's plantar, plantar fasciitis, pain that's posterior is the Achilles. And Achilles tendonitis generally will come in two areas. It will come in the middle of the tendon, what we call mid-substance Achilles tendonitis, and it'll come at the insertion where the tendon inserts onto the calcaneus bone. On exam, these people will be tender in the Achilles. There is usually swelling either in the mid-substance or at the insertion. A quote-unquote pump bump can be there posteriorly, and you may have swelling in both, but it's on exam, it's usually often, well, I should say often quite obvious, especially when people have a lot of swelling. Um, and usually the area of pain is fairly easy to localize and patients are able to localize it fairly well. Treatment for this also is usually non-operative and there can be some of the things that are similar, including ice, rest, and NSAIDs. A small heel lift can be really helpful. Again, you're just trying to offload that Achilles and provide a little less stretch and strain when people are doing activities. Sometimes people will um, auto-treat themselves. They'll say, hey, I found out that my clogs just feel better, so I've been wearing them, and my zero-drop ultras just weren't doing it for me, and so I had to give those up. So sometimes people will do that on their own, but encouraging them to go that route can be helpful. Similarly, especially when people are really in distress, a short period of immobilization, cam walker and a cast can be helpful. Um, you know, in the past, we really used to say no steroid injections. That's probably not true. There's at least one study recently that showed not very many adverse events, really no difference in steroid injections and other injections. Um, but So I would say have a lot of caution with steroid injections because there's always that risk, be it theoretical or real, about rupture. And ruptures can be obviously a real problem. Um, there are other injections. People have now started to look at um, uh, saline, high volume saline injections, as well as um, other anti-inflammatories that can show some promise as well. So there are some other things in the arsenal that can try. PRP has actually been extensively studied and has not been shown to be better than placebo, unfortunately, but it is an option, certainly that does not have the rupture risk. Um, you know, and then stem cells are 
stem cells, and I'm sure there's a talk about that at some point, so I won't even mention it beyond that. Um, surgery really is reserved for failed conservative management. The benefit I will say about surgery for Achilles tendonitis is the results are much, much better than they are for plantar fasciitis. You're talking you know, about 90% successful results in, in pain relief. So this is a procedure we, again, only come to when people have failed their non-operative treatment, but is more reliable in terms of its results, thankfully. Um, you always gotta be worried about the Achilles rupture. And so I bring this up, maybe some of you have seen in your practice, maybe not. It's not nearly as common as tendonitis or plantar fasciitis, but I bring it up just to mention it because every year, myself and my partners will see ones that get missed. So I want people to know what it is to make sure that these people are not getting missed because early treatment really is the main thing and really help these people. So the most typical population are men in their 30s and 40s, athletes and weekend warriors alike. It's relatively rare, sorry, that should be seven per 100,000 population, apologize for the typo. Only about 10% of people will have prior Achilles symptoms. So the vast majority of people are completely asymptomatic prior to having this sensation that they were kicked in the heel. People will often relate that they turned around, they looked, no one was there. You know, watch the picture of Adam Wainwright thinking he dropped a bat on his heel. You watch, you know, Beckham look behind him. It's really almost pathognomonic when that happens. But it often is not painful. Um, so people will walk funny, they'll limp and they'll feel weak, but because it's not necessarily painful, it can sometimes present a little oddly. Um, you know, where it typically happens is in this watershed area. The Achilles is a very large tendon and subjected to huge loads and forces. And about four to six centimeters from the insertion is where you get this watershed and it's weakening. And the thought is that there's probably some micro tearing that's there, you know, sub some sort of kind of previous trauma and you get this kind of catastrophic failure during these episodes of kind of forced dorsiflexion and explosive um, uh, plantar flexion. Um, on clinical exam, this is where the clinical exam is maybe the best, one of the best clinical exams, I'll argue, in all of orthopedics and maybe all of medicine, which is the Thompson test. In the acute setting, the Thompson test is phenomenal. You can usually feel a palpable defect. It's usually four to six centimeters, though obviously it can vary a little bit. These people will have decreased plantar flexion strength, but that Thompson test, which is squeezing the calf and seeing if they get plantar flexion, is crucial in the early period. In the early period, and we'll go over it when we talk about the exam, this becomes less reliable later on. But early on, it is so good, it's actually better than an MRI. Uh, and that is the beauty of this. You can save a very expensive test and you can be more sure about a diagnosis, again, in the early period. Later on, it becomes less reliable, and we'll talk about what else you can do um, in that setting. And for the Achilles ruptures, the initial treatment really is the key. And I'll hate to say it, but just putting them in a cam walker is, is not good enough. You know, ideally you'd put these people in a splint. As we all know, people are not always compliant and they can take off a cam walker. And the problem is you really need them to sit in that plantar flex position in order to get the two ends of the tendon back in order to meet each other. And so you really have to be in that position. So if you are gonna put someone in a cam walker, you need to put them in with heel lifts and it really has to be worn like a cast. I mean, they have to sleep in it, they have to wear it all the time, they can't take it off to shower because taking it off will then stretch out the tendon and that can be problematic. And the reason for that is that it allows us to go through this algorithm of doing either surgery or non-operative treatment. And one of the things that has come up really in the last 10 years is a better way of doing non-operative treatment for Achilles ruptures, acute Achilles ruptures. And so there's a little bit of debate and there's a little bit of a pro and con. The benefit is if you catch it early and you put them in a splint, both of these options become viable. If they get stretched out after about two weeks, non-operative treatment probably isn't viable anymore and they will likely need surgery. And so that's where the early diagnosis becomes really crucial and that early treatment that really allows both doors to be opened and you're not closing one door early on where someone might benefit. So the big benefits of surgery, you know you get the tension of that tendon to the proper degree, and getting that tension proper is what's gonna hopefully allow those people to regain their strength and get that kind of peak end strength that we're looking for. It likely has a lower rupture rate, though this is a little bit debatable with the newer protocols. You know, it feels like you did something. A lot of people will really feel like they want, you know, the thing. They want the thing that Beckham had, that Kobe had, that Clay had, that, you know, 
uh, KD had, you know, you name it, uh, Acres, you know, innumerable people. It also might have a possible quick, quicker return to higher level activity. And you might have this higher peak end plantar flexion strength. So with some of the newer studies that have come out, they've shown maybe a little bit of benefit towards the surgery in these areas. And those may or may not be a crucial thing for your patient. The cons, obviously cost, and no doubt there's a higher complication rate, especially wound problems. You know, typically these days we're doing the Achilles surgeries through a smaller procedure. A lot of us are doing through this percutaneous. So the wound problems are really low, but they're not zero. And so there's certainly those risks, and especially in patients who might have things that predispose them to room problems. The benefit of non-op treatment, less complications for sure. No surgical pain, no issues with anesthesia if they have lung or heart problems and that sort of thing. The cons, there may be a higher rupture rate and the tension may not be restored as well. And when I tell people is non-op treatment is not just no surgery or no treatment. Non-op treatment is a very, very specific protocol that people have to follow in order to get these kind of equivalent results. It has to start pretty much from week one and ideally day one or day two to really kind of get back there. And so early recognition is the key to leaving both of these open and then, you know, getting them to see one of us so we can have the discussion and really figure out and get a plan that is right for that patient. And I definitely have patients go both ways and with good results on both ends. So I know that that is possible. Um, we do know that this early motion is really helpful and it may kind of decrease that re-rupture rate. And so again, it's a very, very specific protocol that's kind of come about that's shown these good and equivalent results. All right, moving on to PK3, where we start separating things, talk about ankle sprains. I'm sure some of you have had it. I know I had, I grew up playing basketball. It was an every year type of thing. And this affects men and women of all ages, 600,000 sprains per year in the US. It's three to 5% of all ED visits in the soccer slash football playing world of the UK. Symptoms, usually pain in the ankle, swelling, and you can have difficulty with weight bearing. Some people can weight bear just fine. Other people won't be able to walk at all. Most common ligament that's injured is the ATFL. The ATFL stands for the anterior talofibular ligament, going from the talus to the fibula. You see it pictured right here in the red circle. It's that inversion injury that usually um, stretches this and tears it to a varying degree. Um, when we grade a sprain, we usually grade it on how much is torn between one and three, three being a complete tear and one being a very small partial tear. Um, the importance about this is that even when you tear these ligaments, the mortise will be maintained because those high ligaments, the syndesmosis and the deltoid ligament on the inside are still there. And so the ankle mortise itself is still intact, which means that people can walk, people can generally do a lot of things. So even with a grade three uh, sprain, when you completely tear those ligaments, these people often are still really quite functional. And that's why the majority of these will be asymptomatic at one year, no matter how they're treated. Harry Kane, unfortunately for the US, although he didn't score against us, was able to get back even within you know, a week of his sprain. But sometimes it can be several months before people get back. So usually we really do this limited early mo mobilization. We put people in the cam walker just for you know, one to three weeks, but we get people moving early, which seems to get people back to activities and other things early on, helps their motion. And we really reserve surgical repair of these ligaments for people with prolonged you know, greater than six months of symptoms or recurrence of instability, AKA, you know, Steph Curry. Um, those are the people for the vast majority of these 95, 98%, this non-operative treatment with early motion, early rehab will get people back and make them fine. Um, the high ankle sprain is a little bit different and often the mechanism is a little bit different. You can see um, from, you know, one of the gunners here, it often will be that kind of dorsiflexion and eversion injury because it's getting the higher ligaments up where you're separating along the, those uh, ligaments, the uh, anterior inferior tib-fib ligament and posterior inferior tib-fib ligament and interosseous ligament. But they can often go together too, and it can be a little bit uh, difficult to assess early on. So when you're concerned about a high ankle sprain, you want to look for pain out of proportion to injury, prolonged recovery, pain posterior to the fibula, pain that goes up the leg towards the knee, pain really above the ankle joint, difficulty with one hop leg and pain with dorsiflexion of the ankle. And we'll show some uh, physical exams that can help with that in the next portion as well. So how do you determine if it's a sprain versus a fracture you're seeing in the clinic? And the answer is 
Well, the sprain is usually an acute twisting injury, pain and swelling of the ankle, bruising, difficult with weight bearing, and fractures have acute twisting injury, pain and swelling of the ankle, bruising, and difficult with weight bearing. So our good friends up north came up with these auto ankle rules. And the auto ankle rules are a good guide, but they're not perfect. So the auto ankle rules in short, without going through them in gory detail, is that if you have pain over bony prominences, namely the posterior fibula, the medial malleolus, the navicular, the base of the fifth, or people have difficulty with weight bearing, that's the quick and dirty of it, they should get an x-ray because there's some concern for fracture. And they found in those studies that they, they were basically the rate of missing, you know, crucial things was really low. There are some things that are missed in the auto ankle rules though, just for y'all to be aware of. Anterior process of the calcaneus fracture, lateral process of the talus fracture, osteochondral lesions of the talus and loose bodies, non-displaced talar body fractures. And in the US and really around the world, as we all age, you should be really cognizant of neuropathics. Neuropathics can have devastating fractures and walk into your clinic because obviously they're not feeling it. And so just being able to walk on it and not having pain doesn't always mean you should get an x-ray. And the reality is we all have to use our best judgment. And so if you're at all concerned, get an x-ray because that's the only way you're gonna truly know whether it's a sprain or not. And so virtually everyone who walks into my clinic gets an x-ray because even though I trust my physical exam, you know, there's things that do get missed and we just can't, exam can't get everything. So I like the combination of the two. And an orthopedic surgeon, so love imaging. All right, uh, also in all these talks, I do like to talk about Liz Franks. Again, this is something that just gets missed a lot. And so I wanna keep it on people's radar so at least people are thinking about it, right? So the Liz Frank joint is the joint that runs between the tarsal and the metatarsal bones of the foot. Um, they're both dorsal and plantar ligaments. The plantar ligaments are the really stronger ones. Um, and it's strongest between the medial cuneiform and the base of the second. It's the same in adults and kids. For Liz Frank injuries, really any twisting, loading injury can the foot can cause them. Most commonly, we talk about this injury, which is the direct or indirect contact with an axial load to a plantar flex foot. But it can happen during twisting injuries or other things, you know, cleats that are crunched. We see it, yeah, in football uh, when people are tackled and that sort of thing. And so when you're seeing this, people who are painful walking, pain in the midfoot. So people who have had an injury such as this and have pain in the foot, and especially if they have swelling like this, they need an x-ray and they need weight-bearing x-rays. Just an x-ray itself often is not enough to diagnosis and sometimes the initial x-rays are not even quite enough. You know, we can, I don't know, I don't wanna speculate about Jimmy G's injury, but obviously trying to assess that took a multi-day thing and he's getting God knows what in terms of his workup. So these can be a little bit tough to figure out, but the worst thing to do is just to not have anything. And so if you're concerned at all, people have midfoot swelling after these injuries, they really need to get x-rays and if at all possible, a weight-bearing x-ray. And then we can talk about whether CT or MRI after that, but that's beyond kind of the scope of this. All right, and then our, our final uh, penalty taker of the day to hopefully uh, put us into the quarterfinals here, bunions, everyone's favorite topic and certainly mine. Um, so they are relatively high. Um, you know, they occur in about 24% of patients and colloquially bunion can mean anything, you know, it just means prominence along that great toe. But for the orthopedic surgeon and the foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon, it really means hallux valgus. And so these patients will come in with pain in their great toe, especially with shoe wear and deformity and the erythema and swelling. And hallux valgus itself is really a complex deformity of this very complex joint. The great toe does not get enough credit for kind of one, how many, how much the force is going through that joint and kind of how complex it is and what it has to do in terms of its range of motion, um, you know, push off and, and the, the lack of, and the, so forth. And what typically happens for bunions, although there is some variation that we don't have time to get into for this talk, is you'll have kind of a deviation and a rotation and then the structures on the inside get loose and the structures on the outside get tight and everything will kind of tighten and curve and it kind of will reach a point of no return. So you get this lateral deviation with medial deviation of the phalanx. And as that happens, the joint will get malaligned and people will become painful. People will get a bony prominence due to the inflammation on the outside, have trouble with shoe wear and everything else. Treatment for this most often is just kind of adapting to it, which means shoe wear modifications, orthotics, bunion sleeves, or pads. Gastroc stretching can be helpful to help minimize uh, pain over that area. When uh, the 
symptoms are bad enough, I mean, the only way to truly get rid of a hallux valgus is surgery. And surgery almost always means reshaping, reforming, correcting the deformity, which means cutting bones, adjusting ligaments, usually inserting hardware. Um, and there are innumerable, well, there, I shouldn't say innumerable, but there's greater than 100 different surgical procedures described. And so the tough part about this is someone will say, oh, my neighbor had a bunion surgery and they got better in two weeks, but my mom had a bunion surgery and she took a year to get better. And that's because there's many different procedures, there's many different types, severities, and so they're not all the same. And so this, it really needs to be kind of an individualized treatment when it comes to surgery. And for the vast majority of these, it is a really long recovery. And so that's important to be aware of. And for that reason, we really, I certainly like to counsel people that, you know, we really reserve surgery for when, you know, the pain is really severe and it's really limiting. That's usually what I tell people. It's possible for us to make a bad toe into a good toe, but it's really hard for us to make a good toe into a great toe. And so, you know, in terms of bunion surgery, it really should be reserved for when symptoms are bad enough. All right, with that, uh, I will thank you. Uh, go Roots. And we'll move on to the, uh, the goalie portion of the penalty kick out or penalty shootout in the physical exam. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Tullier. Uh, we're going to mic you up here. There are a couple of questions, though, that were in the uh, chat, if that's OK. Um, one person asked about topical nitroglycerin for tendinosis. I was wondering if you might be able to comment on that. Uh, yeah, plus minus. Um, admittedly, I've tried it a couple of times. I've not had good success for it. Um, obviously, the idea is that you know you're going to kind of open up and increase the blood supply and the vascularity there. Um, I, I have not had success with it. Um, I did, certainly don't think it's wrong. Um, the trials that I know, and I admittedly have not looked this up in a number of years, um, so I don't know if there's anything new I'm missing, but they were small series and kind of you know, so-so results. Certainly a reasonable thing to try. Admittedly, when I tried it a while back, I did not have great success with it in, in my, you know, small number of patients. So I haven't gone back to it, but good question. And one other question was, are there specific physical therapy and home exercises for bunions? Um, not really, uh, to be quite honest. I mean, the deformity is kind of the deformity and nothing will really correct that deformity. Um, however, um, you know, some people will find that like the yoga toes to split them out, you know, being barefoot at home, stretching out, kind of gripping towels and things like that to kind of keep the, what we call the intrinsic muscles in the foot, the foot, the muscles that allow you to abduct and adduct your toes can be helpful in kind of keeping that space open and preventing other things like hammer toes and things like that. Um, so there isn't anything that will reverse, uh, the hallux valgus or bring it back. You know, most of the pain from Alex Fox is really intra-articular or from rubbing on the shoes. And so that physical therapy doesn't do. However, keeping the muscles within the foot strong by using those intrinsic, by spreading out those toes, by doing things like gripping towels or picking up cotton balls with your toes can be helpful in preventing some of the things that kind of go along with bunions. <laughs>